Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the book of 2 Samuel, the book of 2 Samuel in chapter number 21. We are on our last couple of message dealing with the life and ministry of David before we go on to new things with this brand new year. We're excited with the theme of this brand new year that with God all things are possible and to encourage people throughout the year that with God all things are possible. The three main messages or series we'll be going through all encourage people about the great God that we have. We'll start off with the beginning of the year dealing with the life and ministry of Elijah and Elisha walking through their lives and ministries and seeing how God used them and the great miracles that occurred. We know that Elijah was used of God to see six major miracles. Elisha prayed for a double spirit. And so guess how many major miracles he saw? Double that, 14. And then we'll be going through the gospel record of Mark, which is the gospel record of action. It's written to the Roman mind. The Romans didn't want to hear a lot of discourses or talks. They respected action. And so there are 16 chapters in the gospel record of Mark. 12 of those chapters start with the word and. And they all show the continual action of Jesus working and moving, proving that he was the servant of God. And that he was able to do these great miracles which the Romans were looking forward to seeing actual action. And then at the end of the year next year we'll be finishing up with the life and ministry of Moses. And probably one of my biggest series yet because there's a lot of Moses. The five books of Moses take up one fifth of the word of God. It's quite a bit of history to go through. We'll be kind of bypassing the laws and hitting the narrative and actually hitting his life. But with it, we'll see a lot of miracles that God did within the life and ministry of Moses. As for now, we're finishing up our current series. And we find our way to the book of 2 Samuel chapter number 21. The book of 2 Samuel chapter 21. And if you remember as we go through this, that the first 20 chapters was dealing with a narrative that really show that there's consequences for her action. And it all traces bit by bit by bit the different consequences because of one night in sin. Now as we hit chapter 21, 22, 23, and 24, we're hitting some other major stories, major events within the life of David that don't necessarily fit that narrative, but still are important nonetheless. Today, if you don't mind, we're going to look at 2 Samuel chapter 21, and we're going to start in verse number 15. <clears throat> the book of 2 Samuel 21, and starting at verse number 15. Notice if you don't mind, verse number 15, the word of God says this, Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel. And David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines. And David waxed faint. And Ish by Benoth, which was one of the sons of the giant, who, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. But Abishai, the son of Zechariah, secured him and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swear unto him, saying, Thou shalt uh, go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light. Of Israel. And it came to pass after this that there was yet again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. And Sibachai the Hushakite slew Saph, which was of the sons of the giant. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines, where Elaanan, the son of Jehorajim, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. And there was yet a, a battle in Gath. And there was a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers and every foot six fingers, four and twenty in number. And he was also born to the giant. And when he had defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimei, the brother of David, slew him. 
These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, will you mark a phrase that we find in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 21? The book of 2 Samuel and chapter number 21. And we find the phrase born to the giant in Gath. Born to the giant in Gath. And with the Lord's help, we're going to hit this idea here of facing these giants. The giants that are born in Gath. If you don't mind, let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for you being a wonderful God. And as we come up to you, Lord, we just know that you're a God who loves us so very much. And that you're a God who wants us to have victory. We understand the Christian life could be summarized by these two words of building and battling. And that without, with no battles, there can be no victory. Victory only comes when there's hardships, when there's trials, when there's battles. And we know that if we're going to have victory in our life, that also means that there's going to be some building. There's going to be some battles that ought to be won. We know that there's some easy battles in our life. Then there's some battles that include giants, giants that look undefeatable, giants that look way too big for us to face. I'm asking that you would help these dear folks here because some of them I know are facing some giants. Maybe it's physical health, maybe it's finances, maybe it's family, but they're facing some giants. I'm asking that this message would be an encouragement, that you would open up the Bible in a special way so that way they can go out of here prepared and knowing that they can have the victory because of Jesus Christ. Lord, do something today. Fill me with your precious spirit. And that you would be a help to these good folks. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We know in the Bible that there are many different giants. Giants that have always been raging against God's people. And there were times that the people brought the fight to the giants. We remember Caleb who said, I want that mountain. I'm 85 years old and I know there's a mountain there. And that doesn't just have giants on there. Those are giant giants. Those are giants to the giants. And I'm 85 years old, but I want that mountain. And he was willing to go up there by faith and get that mountain because of the victory God had promised him. We know that David, the little shepherd boy, when he faced Goliath, he didn't have a tank. He didn't have guns. He had with him a staff and a sling and rocks with him. And God got him the victory. God is the one who got him the victory. But the giants weren't done. We could see later on in David's life. In fact, David is king at this time. Many people put this first battle right after David's sin with Bathsheba. Right after... Uh, Joab had killed <clears throat> under David's order uh, Bathsheba's husband Uriah the Hittite. And that David had gone out to battle as the Philistines were out there. And David goes out and faces giants. In fact, we find four giants here that are related to Goliath. And all of them wanted to do their best to take David out. To take his men out. To take out the light of Israel. As we come here. With the first thing we want to discuss. Is in this passage here. The giants David faced. The giants David faced. And. 2 Samuel chapter 21, we have a listing of four different giants and the events that occur with them. Some of them have a little information, some of them have a little bit more. But the first one we come up to is ish Inebob. That's a cool name if you ever needed a name to name someone. ish Binob. Notice if you don't mind in verse number 15. Moreover the Philistines had yet war again with Israel. And David went down and his servants with him. And fought against the Philistines. And notice this. And David waxed faint. The word faint in the Bible carries the idea of quit. And so David was fighting hard. He's tired. He's growing faint. He feels like he's going to quit. Uh, the, the battle is raging. Verse 16. And Ish ben Binoff which was one of the sons of the giant, weight, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, being girdled with a new sword. Notice this, thought to have slain David. So David's in the midst of the battle, and then this giant locks, puts his attention, targets David. And in the midst of the battle, David is waxing faint. He is tired. He probably is wounded at this time. The giant comes and 
thinks he actually kills David. Maybe it was a killing blow. Maybe he knocked David out. Whatever it is, you could see David there lying in the dust. The giant raising his hands in triumph. He's excited and he's letting all the Philistines know they have finally defeated David. But that's when Abishai come in. You always wonder why David kind of was polite to Abishai. Well, this is probably the reason. Notice verse 17. But Abishai, the son of Zuchah, remember this is Joab's brother, secured him. That means he came in and rescued David. David's looking there. Maybe he's wounded. Maybe he's knocked out. Maybe he's so weak and he can't go on. But Abishai goes and grabs his king, pulls him out, and he fights the giant. But not just fights the giant, he killed him. After that, the men of David said, listen, you don't need to go out and fight anymore. We'll take care of business. We're going to take care of these giants. But here was a giant that almost toppled David. And there's many different reasons why that may have happened. But here is a giant that almost toppled David. Then we go on and we can see some more of Goliath's family starting to go on. Verse 18, we have Saph, the, giant, uh, the son of Goliath. That was slain in battle by one of David's servants. Verse number 19. We have another one. The Bible actually names him in 1 Chronicles 20 and verse 5. As Laami. L-A-H-M-I. He's the brother of Goliath. And he gets in a fight. And finally there, uh, he was killed in the midst of battle. And verse number 20. And there was yet a battle in Gath. And there was a man of great stature. And this guy was a little bit notable because he had six fingers on each hand. And he had six toes on each feet. And so he could easily count up to 21 if he took off his shoes and socks. He was notable because that would be strange to see someone with more fingers than what you're used to. But he was in the midst of the battle. And finally, uh, this one was killed by Jonathan. And this is notable because Jonathan is often known as a different guy in the Bible. You often hear him as Jonadab, the friend of Amnon. Remember, Amnon had a friend, and his friend's name was Jonadab. He was a very subtle man. Well, we could see that eventually he got in in the action, and he was there fighting giants as well. And so we could see in the midst of all of this that giants were faced by David and his men. And each one of them had to be conquered. Each one of them had to be defeated. And each one of them had the purpose of trying to defeat and still and quit kill God's people to put them out of the fight. Now, whereas today we do fight a battle, it's not the same physical battle that, that David faced, but it is just as real we fight a spiritual battle. Every single one of us, if you've come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, is part of a spiritual battle. And the giants that we face are even more terrifying. The giants we face are more debilitating. The giants we face often get more victories than David and his men had. So if you don't mind, may we take the Word of God and turn to the New Testament. And look with me, if you don't mind, in the book of 2 Corinthians. Uh, Corinthians, the book of 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. The book of 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And I'd like to cover the second thing and the last thing we're going to cover where we're going to spend and park it here. The giants we face. So we talked about the giants that David faced. But let's talk about the giants we face. How do we face these unsurmountable giants? How do we face these tall, huge, intimidating giants? giants. How do we face these giants that have built up within our life? If you don't mind, I'd like to take the word of God as the apostle Paul is writing to the church of Corinth and explain the battle that these people are in. We could see that they're in the midst of a spiritual battle and we could see three specific things of dealing with these giants. The very first thing I'd like to show you is the meekness and gentleness of Christ. The meekness and gentleness of Christ. Notice with me, if you don't mind, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Notice with me in verse 1. Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold towards you, 
But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence. Wherewith I think to be bold against some. Which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Now the Apostle Paul is dealing with some things within the church of Corinth. That within the church of Corinth there happens to be four different factions. Four different groups. You have the group that says... I'm of Paul. You have the other group that says, I'm of Cephas. The other group, I'm of Apollos. Then the super spiritual group, I'm of Christ. And with here you have the I am of Paul group. Remember the Apostle Paul was the founder of the church of Corinth. And so they say, we stand with the founder. Whatever Paul says, we do. And they built their own little faction that they kind of circled around Paul. Or at least Paul's idea, Paul's figurehead. And this is the type of group that they have. This is the way that it's always been done. And we're not going to change. This is the way it's always going to be done. It is us four and no more. And so they have the idea that this is the way that things always have done. Then you have the I'm of Apollos group. Apollos was a great evangelist. A great preacher. A very eloquent man. Someone who was studying the scriptures. And A lot of people, he was a great influence. A great preacher came in. And so a lot of people said, this is what Apollos says. And this is what Apollos does. And this is what my favorite preacher says. And this is how the internet preacher says to do it. And so they go ahead and circle around what someone else has done. And they hitch their wagon to that group. Then you have the I'm of Cephas group. As far as we know, Peter, which is uh, the... The name Cephas, Cephas is his Hebrew name. Peter is going to be the Greek name. As far as we know, Peter had never visited Corinth. But you had a bunch of people that had been influenced by Judaism. Maybe they had gone down and seen Jerusalem. Maybe they had visited the church of Jerusalem. Maybe some uh, way they got influenced. But they said, listen here. This is how they do it at that church. And this is how I think we ought to do it. This is how they train them down here. And that's how they want to do it. Then you have the super spiritual group. They sound all nice that I'm of Christ. But the way that they say that has the idea that we're right and you're wrong. And so you have these four factions that have banded together and are splitting the church. So the Apostle Paul writes the book of 1 Corinthians and he's correcting all their behavior over and over and over. He gives correction and gives a correction. By the time 2 Corinthians comes up, a lot of the churches behave. However, a couple of the groups have merged together and they're standing against Paul. And can you imagine the heartbreak Paul had? These people are people he led to the Lord. These are people he discipled. And now they banded together and they said, we don't want Paul to tell us what to do. And what happens in the book of 2 Corinthians is that Paul has to defend himself and his apostleship because his message is on the line, because it's God's message. You see, the old adage, if we could disqualify the preacher, we disqualify his message. And so what they're doing is they're attacking Paul. And they're doing very hurtful attacks. So when the Apostle Paul is writing this, he's in the midst of spiritual attack. He's in the midst of spiritual warfare. And the people that's directly doing this is the church of Corinth. And so he says, let me tell you how I'm going to deal with this. There's a lot of spiritual attack. and You want to know how I'm going to deal with this? I'm going to deal with this with the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I'm going to deal with this with the meekness and gentleness of Christ. You understand when people react badly to you, you don't have to react badly to them. We could respond to people with meekness and gentleness. In the midst of a spiritual warfare, it's often that meekness, that quiet spirit that will get the victory because that's what God is looking for. Can we trust God? It's amazing how people will solve arguments. Maybe you've seen this. I've been in counseling sessions where they believe might makes right. So what they do is they call up all of their friends and they all show up and say, all these people agree with me. Well, that's fine. It doesn't matter how many people agree with you. What does the Bible say? What is right? You don't have to build up an army to build your case. You just stand on the scriptures. You stand on what's right. And you do it with meekness. 
that oftentimes we get ourselves in trouble when we are right. You say, how does that work? Because our pride gets in the way. Because we know our, we're right, we're going to convince them that we're right. And that doesn't convince people at all. How many times has somebody turned over a new leaf because they saw a Facebook post? Let me tell you, I saw this Facebook post and I changed my whole worldview because someone put a nice little meme on there. And that convinced me. That, that baby Yoda thing, all of a sudden I knew I was wrong and my heart melted. Nobody said that. Nobody's ever been convinced because someone decided to put a prideful thing and prove everyone wrong. We could trust that God's spirit will do it right. We can let God fight our battles for us. Our response to anyone that wants to attack or is responding in correctness should be with the meekness and gentleness of Christ. That's how we should be responding to folks. There's a second thing here, and this is going to be key. We could see a second thing here, not only the meekness and gentleness of Christ, but we see the pulling down of strongholds. The pulling down of strongholds. Now, there's quite a bit with this. Notice with me, if you don't mind, in verse number three. For though we walk in the flesh, we war do not war after the flesh. Verse number three is so important for the idea of how to win, how to deal, how to fight giants, how to deal with spiritual warfare. Verse number three. If you're writing notes, what you need to write in big, bold, boxcar letters, people are not our enemy. People are not our enemy. We don't fight after the flesh. We don't war after our flesh. Our battle is a spiritual warfare. We do not fight against people. You may think that person hates you, but your spiritual battle is not with that person. That person is not your enemy. If we could understand this principle, it solves so much that we don't have to attack people personally. It's not a personal attack. We don't fight against flesh and blood. We may walk in the flesh. You may be here physically. But our war is not after the flesh. People are not our enemy. Notice verse number 4 as it continues with that thought. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Meaning that when you're dealing with people, you don't use a physical weapon. Meaning you don't take a crowbar and hit someone in the head and convince them that you're right. That's not how we solve it. That's not how you deal with it. Our weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but notice this. But are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, let's define our terms. What's a stronghold? A stronghold carries the idea of a castle or a fortress. So, here God is using very vivid, colorful language so we could get a picture in our mind. So what we have here is our weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Meaning you're not using a physical weapon. You're not having a crowbar. You don't have a gun. You don't have a sword. You're not using those to fight your battles. But instead we have something that is mighty and is so mighty through God that it could actually pull down strongholds. Pull down foragers. Pull down... <coughs> Uh, things that have been built up in your own life. Notice with me in verse 5. Casting down imaginations, every high thing that it exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. If you're still writing things in big bold boxcar letters, put the battleground is in our mind. The battleground is in our mind. This is where things are won or lost. <clears throat> so you say, where did these castles come from? Where did the fortresses, where did the strongholds come from? Well, let me tell you where they came from. You built them. You built it brick by brick by brick. By every thought. May I give you an example? 
Let's say that we're going to go to camp. And at camp they have a zip line. And so they make you climb up all those stairs all the way to the top. And they got you harnessed up. And they click you in. And then they bring you over to the side. And they click you in again. And you lean over the side. And everyone's looking down. And they're saying, jump, you can do it. And you look down and realize that you have to take a step of faith. And you have to step off. And there's many of a big brave man who decided, nope, that's not going to happen. And usually, what do we tell someone who's never done it before? We tell them, don't think about it, just do it. Why do we say that? Do we say that thinking is bad? No, what we're trying to understand is that they're going to build a stronghold. This is how it works. They stop and they pause, and they have a thought. And they don't deal with that thought properly, but they put it down. Then they look at it some more, and they take another thought... And it stacks brick by brick by brick until now it is a stronghold that they can't defeat. They built it themselves by adding thought by thought by thought by thought. Now they can't defeat it. They unhook, go back down the stairs, never get to enjoy the ride. You understand that's what we do all the time. Let me give you another example. That's a kid example, but that's something we can relate to. Maybe there's someone that you've never interacted with, but you're convinced they hate you. So you look at it in your mind and they hate me. The way they look at me, they didn't talk to me, pastor didn't shake my hand, whatever it is. And that thought comes and you don't deal with it properly, so you lay it down. Then you think about it some more and you find another piece of evidence in your mind. And you put another brick there. Then you place another brick. Until now you've built a nice fortress. And you never talked to the person yet. But you are convinced not only do they hate you. They want to destroy you. And it's built in your mind. And now you can't shake it off. You finally shake hands with them. And, and they say hi how are you doing in your mind. What do they mean by that? I know they're thinking of something else. And you convinced yourself in your mind you built a nice little fortress that can't be toppled and you can't be shaken from it because it's built up. Maybe it's something more serious. Maybe something happened to you that was tragic and horrible. And a thought comes to your mind and you don't deal with it properly and you build it up. And you think about that incident. You think about that situation and you can't forgive the person. And, and, and it bothers you. And you build up another brick. And another brick. And another brick. And you think about it all the time. And every thought, you're adding another brick to this fortress. Until some of you have some big looming castles that are built on big cliff walls. When you look down, you don't see the bottom. You see nothing but fog. And you look up and you see the spires up there. And by the way, you built that thing. But it is so dominating. You could see the lightning in the background, the moon behind it, the, the fog behind it. And you look at this fortress and it is so overwhelming. It is so dominating. You look at it and you feel weak. You look up at it and you say, there's no way. I can't take this. I can't build it. I can't deal with this. The good thing, notice again in verse number four. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You know what the spiritual war happens, occurs? Is that God is able to topple some of those fortresses that you built, that you put together. Thought by thought by thought. You know what God can do? He could change your thinking. Sometimes you have developed the habit of thinking wrong about a person. Maybe you've developed the habit of not forgiving someone. You know God can give you lots of grace to pull down that stronghold in your life so it's no longer dominating. So it's no longer conquering you. But instead God can conquer that. Remember what I said, the battlegrounds in your mind say, how do I deal with that? I, I had this stronghold. People with addictions, you know what they did? 
cigarette by cigarette by cigarette. They have built them a stronghold. Now they can't defeat it. They can't topple it. They can't blow it over. You name your addiction. You name your thing you just can't get over. But you built that thing and you can't conquer it. God can. He is mighty through the pulling down of strongholds. Mighty through God. How does it happen? How do we deal with this? The battlegrounds in the mind. Notice this verse number five. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We start off with the idea that you take every imagination, every thought, and you compare it against the knowledge of God. What does the Bible say about this? What does God think about this? How does God respond to this? What does God respond to me? You have to compare everything in the light of Scripture. Everything. Because we understand our hearts will lie to us. Your feelings will lie to you. Your mind will lie to you. But God's Word will not lie to us. And we have to compare it to what the Bible says. For example, the Bible talks about in the book of Philippians... That we're supposed to have every thought. It says, think upon these things. Whatever is true, whatsoever is lovely, whatsoever is good report, whatever has virtue, what things have ever praised. Think on these things. You actually have to compare. Is what I'm thinking about this person good? Is what I'm thinking about this person lovely? Is what I'm thinking about this person of good report? You actually have to take every thought, every imagination and compare it. Because what it's going to do is it's going to exalt itself against the knowledge of God. So it's going to say, I don't care what the Bible says. I know it's true because I feel like it's true. And it's going to try to exalt itself. You say, but that's not what the Bible says. And we understand, if you're going to be honest, there are times you know it doesn't line up with Scripture, but it feels like you're right. You're going to have to recognize what the Bible says. And you're going to have to make a choice. My feelings can be wrong. What does the Bible say? Notice as it goes on here, and it gives another tip. Bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. How did you build that fortress? Thought by thought by thought. You know how the best way to stop a fortress is don't build it in the first place. So every thought that comes through your mind, you need to develop the habit of taking that thought and saying, is this thought pleasing to Christ? If it is not, the word taking captive carries the idea of encapsulate it. Put it in a capsule. Say, God, I'm bringing this to your obedience. Is this thought pleasing to you? Is this what I should be thinking about this person, this situation, this idea? Is this what I should be thinking? And there are sometimes that thought needs to be crumbled away and thrown away. This has been helpful to me. There are times that I have something goes to my mind. And I know I shouldn't think about it. And so what I do is I even imagine it. Crumpling up a piece of paper. Throwing it away. Sometimes visual aids help us. But if you say you have to do something purposefully with that thought. This thought is not lining up with the Bible. This thought is not what I should be thinking. And I know it. I purposely set it aside. You say, but I do that and guess what? Another thought happens. Yeah, then you have to deal with that thought. Until you get in the habit of dealing with that thought properly. You understand the pulling down of strongholds comes as God changes your thinking. My life verse is Romans 12, 1 and 2. Where it says, I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies... A living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, notice this, by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove the good and perfect and acceptable will of God. How does that start off? By me starting with my body. I give my body to the Lord. What is your body, by the way? It's your five senses. What you taste, what you touch, what you hear, what you see, what you feel. 
I surrender what I see to God. God, only let me see those things that are pleasing to you. So if I watch my eyes and if there's something that's not pleasing to God, I will guard my eyes and say, no, I'm not supposed to look at it. I start by guarding my body. Some people have a bad thought life because of what they put in their little ears. You're trained yourself to think badly because of what you listen to. You take YouTube. YouTube is a lot of junk. And they got a lot of kids who don't know any better having YouTube channels. And they rot your brain cells. And you watch enough of it, you start to speak like them. And start to think like them. And then, heaven forbid, start to act like them. And we could say YouTube, back in our day, it was television shows. You watch certain things and you'll start to act like them, behave like them, think like them. You have to guard what you put in your ears. I surrender what I listen to, to God. I surrender what I look at, to God. I surrender what I smell, to God. You say, well, that's not too bad of a deal, so... I surrender what I put in my mouth to God. I surrender what I feel to God. And as you surrender those to God, and the Bible says, but be not conformed to this world. How are you not conformed to the world? Because you've already surrendered your bodies to God. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Remember, the battleground is in your mind. You can have something legitimately bad, horrible, the most awful thing to ever to happen to you. And it doesn't have to build a stronghold in your life. Now we can empathize and sympathize with people. But oftentimes that just allows them to put some more bricks because they feel justified. I am right in feeling angry. There's sometimes you are right in feeling angry. However, if you're going to have victory, you're going to have to conquer that anger. But it's going to be developing the habit of taking every thought and place into captivity to Christ. That's going to help prevent the strongholds. But God is mighty to be able to pull down some of the strongholds. He can give you victory by grace. Some of the times it's just asking God, God, I cannot defeat this giant. Help me. And maybe five minutes later, I can't defeat this giant. Help me. Another five minutes, I can't defeat this giant. Help me. God will help you. But some of you have developed the habit of building a stronghold. It's not going to go down overnight. You spent 20 years building that thing. It's not going to come down in just one little prayer. But God can help defeat that. And it's going to start with controlling that thought life. So we start off. How do we deal with these giants in our life? Start by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Second of all, by casting down the strongholds, dealing with the thought life and the things that come up. But there's a third thing here. Notice with me in verse number six. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now notice you have the word obedience in verse six and the word obedience in verse five. And verse five, it's taking every captivity uh, taking into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Verse number six, and having the readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So here it comes the idea that as you start developing that thought life, you also need to be ready to revenge all disobedience. That's a nice Bible phrase there. Revenge all disobedience. That carries the idea to punish, to to. to to chastise. That means when you disobey, you need to be ready to beat up that disobedience. Amen. No, I should not do that again. No, that was wrong. No, I need help dealing with that. No, I need to be ready. Part of it, our problem is that we don't have consequences for ourselves for doing wrong. You need to be ready to revenge all disobedience. No, I should not think that away. Now, I'm not talking about beating yourself up and saying, I'm a failure, I'm going to fail. No, 
But you have the idea that you need to be ready to say, no, what I just did was not right. What happens if you start sinning and you don't, are not ready to revenge all disobedience? You start to empathize with it and start to say that's not a big deal. And then that stronghold gets, start building up in your life. But if you're ready to pounce on that and say, that was wrong. I'm not saying you are wrong. I'm saying that was wrong. Remember, we hate the, the sin, love the sinner. That includes yourself. You could hate your sin, but still not hate yourself. I hate that sin. That sin was wrong. Be ready to do, revenge all disobedience. That will help build from building these strongholds and defeat those giants that want to build something in your life. Now again, we understand the battleground is in our mind. It's not with people. People are not our enemy. As much as you just sure that that teacher is out to get you, your enemy is not the flesh and blood. As much as that older brother, you just know they're just planning on killing you. They are not. They're not your enemy. As much as you're convinced that your boss is out to get you, let me tell you, your enemy is not the flesh and blood. The battleground is in the mind. And even if someone does you wrong, it doesn't mean you have to respond wrong. The battleground's in the mind, and God can give us a lot of grace. Now, because the battleground's in the mind, this is almost... A do-it-yourself thing. We could cheer you on, but I can't control how you think. I wish we could. I wish we could tap magic wand or hit someone in the forehead and automatically they think correctly. Wouldn't that solve a lot of problems? I mean, I mean kids think that works, right? That's why they punch each other. and they're, What they're trying to do is trying to say think right, but it doesn't work. They have to be willing to work on their own strongholds. They have to be willing to say the battleground's in my mind and I have to deal with this. Now we could pray with them. We could encourage them. We could support them. But the battleground is in your mind and in their mind. And even if someone else just builds strongholds doesn't mean you have to respond incorrectly. The world around you could be falling apart but you can have the peace of God that passeth all understanding. That phrase carries the idea of having the peace of God when it doesn't make sense. Even when the boss really is out to get you, you can still have the peace of God. Even when you think the government is out to get you, you can have the peace of God. When you think nobody likes you at all, you can still have the peace of God. That passeth all understanding. A peace of God that doesn't make sense. Because the battleground is in our mind. It's not against flesh and blood. For us, we have to take every thought in the captivity, into the obedience of Jesus Christ. When we understand where the battleground is and understand that God can give lots of grace and we don't have to build these strongholds and we don't have to keep those strongholds, it is such a freeing thing within our life that it doesn't matter what the spiritual warfare is, we can still have the victory because of Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 Five three zero six three zero eight. Once again, that number is nine two zero five three zero six three zero eight. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.